Hey guys, and welcome to this message from Church on the Move, Broken Arrow. We're so glad that you joined us today. If you didn't know, Church on the Move is a family of three churches in Northeast Oklahoma. We've got incredible teaching and worship, not just for you, but for your kids and students as well. If you live near one of our locations, we would love for you and your family to come check it out and experience it for yourself. If you got any questions, you can drop a comment below or check out churchonthemove.com for more information. Let's jump into the message. Well, good morning, Church on the Move. How we doing? Everybody all right? Everybody all right? Everybody like who you're sitting next to? Everybody in a good spot? Okay, let's say, I can't do anything about it if you don't. I just thought I'd ask, but... Uh, we're glad you're here. Welcome to everybody that's not in this room. Uh, where's the green light? Right over here. We've got a whole bunch of people watching from everywhere we could find a chair for them. So we're glad that you're with us. If you're here, would you just show some love to the people that are more comfortable than you sitting on couches in the lobby, everybody? Uh, we're glad that we get to be together this morning. Uh, whatever your day or week has been like, I hope this morning you experience the love and joy of Jesus as we study his word together. And uh, if I haven't met you, my name is Ethan, one of the pastors around here, and we are studying through uh, what will be kind of the majority of our fall, a teaching series called How to Be Married. And uh, if, you're, uh, if you lead a team or people at all, you know that sometimes you talk about specific things that feel like they alienate other people. You know what I'm talking about? And marriage is one of those things because not everybody in our church is married. And sometimes it feels like there's single people. I mean, not, I don't, I'm not picking on you, but here's how it kind of works. It feels like I'm turning my back on them to talk about, you know, marriage to the people over here. And I, I would never do that. You're too precious. I would never turn my back on you. Let me turn my back on them. So here's what it feels like sometimes. All right. Uh, because there's folks in our church that are single or single again, um, in different phases of marriage, young kids, empty nest. And, and here's why I think it's important for us to do this. Even though on the outside, you might say, wow, doesn't that leave some people out? Here's why God lifts up this marriage relationship in the middle of humanity and points to it and says, this is good. It's because first and foremost, it reflects our relationship with him. The more we understand it, the more we value it, the more we consider it, the brighter and better picture we get of his love for us. And I think especially in the middle of a world that is broken, it gives us a picture of wholeness. In a world that's divided, come on somebody, it gives us a different picture of unity, something that's possible if the presence of God is in the middle of us. And when marriages are strong, it, it's a tide that lifts all ships. Uh, uh, when families are strong, uh, when marriages are strong, families are strong. When families are strong, communities are strong. And so I believe that it is a life-giving example of the goodness of God, and I think it's worth all of our consideration, whatever stage of life you're in. Now, we're going to uh, be kind of in our home-based text this morning in Ephesians chapter 5. So if you have a Bible, you can turn there. We're going to start in verse 21. As we turn, our team will walk through the auditorium with a stack of Bibles. Wave at them. I would love to give you a Bible if you don't have one. As we turn, here's what I want to remind Mind you that uh, we're going to read some verses today that describe God's ideal for a marriage. Anytime you turn to scripture and you see God painting a picture of his best for something, there's always, in fact, I would say because we are broken and sinful people, it's almost always true that we somehow fall short of that ideal. And maybe for you, as we read today, um, you'll be reminded of a place that you haven't measured up quite right in your marriage. Or maybe it hasn't been modeled for you well with your parents and you've seen some brokenness. Here's my prayer for our church, is that as we read through this, condemnation would dissolve. Uh, uh, Romans chapter eight, verse one says, there is, there, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ. When we go to scripture, we never go to scripture to get a report card for our past. Do you understand that? God doesn't ask you to get in a time machine. He knows you don't own one. You can't go back to the past and fix anything. You will be often called to repentance when you read God's word, but the picture we get from God's word is not so that you leave today getting an A, B, C, D, or F on how you did and if you feel, as we're talking this morning, guilt or shame, my prayer is that by the power of the Holy Spirit, that would just dissolve and that you would leave today with confidence that no matter what your past has been like, the reason we go to scripture is not a report card for a past, but a vision for our future, a picture to say, wow, this is what it could be, regardless of where I've been or where I am right now, this is hope for the future. But for some of you, it might not be condemnation you feel, it might be just pain. You go, wow, that's not how I was treated or that's not how I was loved. 
And today I hope that as you see the picture of how God loves you, you would leave today with new healing. You would leave today going, wow, God loves me like that because the marriage relationship is first and foremost a picture of his love for you. So let's read these verses together. Ephesians chapter five, starting in verse 21, Paul says this, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's the principle. Now he's gonna tell us how the principle works. He turns to wives first and he says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and he is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. In verse 25, he turns to husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Wow. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are all members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Would you pray with me? Lord, we're so thankful that we have a chance to pause our week and consider how much you've loved us as we hold up this picture Help us to understand it clearly. Lord, help all of the fog and the complication that sometimes sets in for a moment this morning just fade away so that we can have clarity how we should move forward with you. We love you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Uh, there's a lot to unpack in Ephesians. This, this is a, a kind of a box full of principles. And each week, we're just going to kind of take out one at a time, okay? So we're not going to get to all of them. We'll just pull out one at a time. And this morning, I want us to consider first and foremost, out of the foundational verse that Paul refers to here in Ephesians, I want us to consider the idea that marriage is a covenant relationship. Now, uh, even though we don't live in a covenant-making culture, most of us don't have um, covenant partners like they did in the ancient world where we've had a blood ceremony or we're partnered with a neighboring tribe for protection in wartime. We understand, I think, inherently a little bit of what a covenant is. Uh, we use the word covenant even today to describe a more significant relationship, yes, but in Scripture, there are only two relationships that are literally covenant-level relationships, your relationship with God and your your relationship with your spouse. Now, you might have a neighborhood covenant with your homeowners association, but that's not quite the same covenant that we're talking about here. Okay, so if you're taking notes, write this down. A covenant relationship is a relationship based on two words, a determined commitment. Write those two words down. I love that picture. It's a statement that this relationship will get the, the best of me and the most, I will, I will make a determination in my heart. I'm committed to you. And we see this in the, the linchpin verse that Paul uses. It's not the first thing he says, but I think it's the foundational thing he says when he quotes this verse from Genesis chapter 2 in Ephesians. You've heard this verse before. This, Paul quotes uh, this in Ephesians 5.31, therefore a man shall leave, if you're taking notes, circle that word leave, his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This is uh, the first verse in Genesis chapter two where God describes what this relationship is supposed to be like. Throughout scripture, especially in the New Testament, this is the most quoted verse about marriage. Jesus in particular goes to this verse Almost every time he's asked about marriage, help us understand this. What is it? Well, he goes back to this. And this, this marriage, this covenant relationship is built on two principles, okay? So we're going to talk about those today, and they're found in these two words, leaving and hold fast. If you grew up in a King James preaching church, you know this is the, this is the word used more often for that, cleave, leave and cleave. Now, come on. You, that, for a preacher, that couldn't get any better. That's the day rhyme. You just put the, like, the low-hanging fruit right in front of me, so you know I got to preach that. All right, so here's the idea, okay? 
A marriage relationship requires, first and foremost, the first principle that we find is it requires the principle of priority, okay? Priority, and you know how this is, uh, Paul says that in order for something to be more important, you have to let go of other things, right? Not everything can exist in your life at the same level of importance. When God says that our, our covenant relationship, first with him and then with our spouse, has to be a priority, he's not just saying that because he's got a big ego and he's living with his elbows out going, you, I, listen, you got to make me first. He's trying to help us understand something. The principle of priority tells us this. Wherever somebody gets first place, power is released. Priorities always release power. And what God wants for you is the power that comes from getting your priorities right. You know how this is. Uh, this works in every area of our life. When you put something as a priority, it, it grows. It gets better. It gets, uh, it, it gets bigger in your life. You have a hobby, all of us. There's something that you geek out about, something that you know everything there is to know about. You spend your time. There's probably tabs on your uh, phone right now on your web browser that are open to things you want to buy for your hobby or things that you're reading about with your hobby. I don't know what it is. It might be for you. It might be fly fishing for you. And you know that there's people in your life, they won't come around you and talk to you because they don't want to talk about fly fishing. You're like, I just don't want to talk about it. I don't, I, they're just going to talk for me, it's running. Okay. Like I'm, I, I just, I, it's why I don't talk about running very much with people because I see their eyes glaze over when I start talking about the offsets of shoes and foam composites and insoles and, 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 and pace running and tempo running and all the different stuff. And I did just go, I don't want to hear about what kind of gels I should run for a t eat for a 10 mile run. I don't care. It's not, it's not what I want to do, but what is that? It get, it grows in my life because I've made it a priority. We see this with young guys in the church all the time. Uh, and I'm very aware of this, especially because my wife and I have two uh, sons that are in this age group. There's guys that have never saved a dime in their life. They've spent most of their time in Star Wars pajamas, playing with Legos, and then they meet a girl. And everything changes for the first time in their life. They care about shaving and they start looking online to see how much engagement rings cost. And then the sticker shock hits and they don't, they didn't realize there was so much to learn about cut and color, but they become experts. And in just a few short weeks, somebody that's never saved any money has found a way to make thousands of dollars to buy an engagement ring. They sold plasma. They got rid of all their video games. And what are they doing? I'm, there's power released. All of a sudden I've found a way to, make ground, to gain ground, because I made it a priority. Everywhere we set priorities, power is released. And so for me in particular, here's what I see as my list of priorities. Now, this is an important exercise because if you get your priorities right, everybody benefits when your priorities are in order. But the opposite is true. Anywhere priorities are misplaced, pain is released. Question, do you know what your priorities are? Especially in a marriage, have you articulated those priorities? For me, here's what I see scripturally, is that if I was to make a list of priorities, Jesus would get first place. My relationship with God is the highest covenant relationship that I will have, even above my relationship with Sarah. When God speaks of covenant, he first makes a covenant with us to help us see how we make a covenant with our spouse. Uh, if you've read through scripture, you know that the first covenant is God makes with a man named Abraham. Have you read this in Genesis chapter 12? God wants us to see that he's gonna make a covenant. He wants to make a covenant or create a way for all people to have this kind of relationship with him. But he wants us to understand this, not in a crowd, but with a person. And so he makes a covenant with one man so we can see that it's personal and how it works. And when he makes a covenant with Abraham, he goes through a ceremony that establishes that I will be your priority and you will be my priority. And in the ancient world, that covenant relationship meant that I would get the best of you and you would get the best of me and I would, get, I would show up and I would be there when you need me, yes? But then what happens is God, and God says this is gonna happen, what I, what I wanna do in you is build a family and then that family's gonna become a nation and out of that nation, there's gonna be a savior that's gonna bless the whole world. So Abraham's family goes into captivity in Egypt, yes? 
when they come out of captivity, they cross the Red Sea, they park at Mount Sinai, and God renews this covenant again. Why? They don't have that relationship with God. They don't know God like that. So he reestablishes this covenant. And do you know what the first thing he says, the rules of the covenant, the very first thing is he says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. What is he doing? I have to be the priority. Why? When, when the creator of life gets the priority of my relationships, the power of life flows into all the relationships below it. And so for me, the next relationship below that is Sarah. For you, it's your spouse. If you're single, you're going to have a, a list of priorities, even though you may not have a spouse right now. After that, for me, it's our kids. Then after that, uh, there's going to be my calling all of us have a calling, even if we don't have a vocation, even if you don't have a job where you would say, I go work nine to five and I make money. You have a calling. There's something that, that you are uniquely positioned to do. That's getting the energy of your life. After that, I'll just put a category that I'll just call family. This is where it gets a little convoluted for some of us. There are friends that should be a higher priority than family based on what, where your family's at and who the friends are, what God's doing in those relationships sometimes crosses over between my extended family and my closest friends and the people God's put around me. And then after that, I'll just put others. There's a, a whole bunch of other people in my life that uh, they're a priority, but they're not high on the priority list. Yes, everybody has to flow here. Now, here's what happens. As I establish priorities, there's going to be a reality of a tug of war between what gets my attention and my time on my priority list. You, you've experienced this. Yeah? When your kids are toddlers, uh, there's just a, a constant nature of their need for you that wasn't there before you had kids. It's like when you have kid, little you know, two, three-year-olds running around the house, it's like trying to keep ping pong balls underwater and they never go to sleep at the same time. And when they do go to sleep, there's always the danger that they might wake up at the drop of a hat. So my relationship with my spouse is now hinging on whether or not I can keep kids asleep long enough to spend time with my spouse. Yes? So there's a tug of war between two who gets my attention? Now, to keep my priorities in order, let me give you two words. These are two words that will help you test and establish your priorities. Okay, and the first word is just the word most. If you're taking notes, write this down. Here's what you know. There are times where people or things lower on your priority list will demand the most of you. You've experienced this in your job, yes? There are times where it's just like it's critical. It's crunch time. We got to burn the candle at both ends. If you're a student, you've experienced this with finals season or a senior project. It's just like that's taking the most of me right now, even though I would say it's number four or five or six on my priority list. This is going to happen at a lot of different seasons in life. When it happens, you have to remember that there's a difference between something getting the most of you and something getting the best of you, okay? Here's what happens with me and Sarah. There have been times, a lot of times, where there's a busy season at work or a busy season with the kids, and what will happen is that will demand the most of her or of me, but what it cannot ever get of me is the best of me. Sarah has to get the best of me, even when something else is getting the most of me. When I was a young pastor, there was a family in the church, a precious family, amazing couple, uh, that their son uh, developed a critical illness and he had to go to a children's hospital out of, out of state. And as a young pastor, I remember driving very nervous to go see this young couple. You just kind of feel the weight of what they must be going through and how this must be for them. And, and I, as I drove to, to meet them, they were in a, like kind of an Airbnb next to this children's hospital. And when I walked in to see them, they were just frazzled. They were just at wit's end, exhausted. You could see it on their face. You could see that they had been crying. This was just difficult for them, what their son was going through the treatments and how much it was demanding of them. And I sat down and talked to him and, and you can imagine how the first part of that conversation went, how, you know, how's your son, what's the treatment? And they gave me the update and this is what's going on. And somewhere about 15 minutes or so into the conversation, one of them just kind of looked at the other and got quiet. And then they looked at me and they said, but can, can we be honest? We're not doing very good at all. 
we can't stand each other right now. We're fighting constantly. Uh, we don't want to be in the same room with each other. Uh, we, we, we don't know if we can keep doing this anymore. And their relationship was being torn apart. And first, as a young pastor, I was just so impressed with their honesty. Nobody had been that honest with me before and just revealed what was going on. And in that moment, I know this was not the wisdom of a young gun coming in with you know all the answers to the world. This was God giving me the words to say in this moment. Yes, have you ever been there? It's just like you kind of know what to say. And I just turned to the husband. I just said, hey, can I just ask you, if you could imagine, and I I know this is going to be hard, but if you could just imagine putting aside all of the stress of this for just a second, pretend you're not the husband in this scenario for just a second, lay aside, and they had talked about how how much there was financial pressure in this, and they didn't know how they were going to pay for all this, and all the, just all of the stuff weighing, weighing, weighing. So if you can just put that aside for a second. And I want you to imagine that you drove into town just like I did right now to see your best friend. What if this was your best friend going through this? How, what would you do if you walked in the room right now to, to see your best friend? He thought for a second, he said, well, I think I'd give her a big hug and ask her how she was doing. I said, yeah, that's great, good start. What, what would you do next? He said, well, I'd, I'd probably see if she wanted something from Starbucks. And, Maybe if she was tired, if she needed to go take a shower and take a nap, and if I could go sit in the hospital room with her son, and I said, okay, okay, pause right there. What you just discovered is that even though right now your son is demanding the most of both of you, it's still possible for you to give her your best. And here's what this might look like. It might look like in the middle of a crazy day, and can we be honest? Nobody in their right mind would look at this couple and say, okay, stop giving your son, the, your, your spouse is your priority. Stop giving your son the most of you. No, everybody in their right mind would go, obviously, you've got to stop the whole story of your life and focus on your son. Nobody is giving marriage advice to that couple saying, you know what you need to do is go buy her a dozen roses and some chocolates and write her a poem. Go see a movie with her. Go take her on a date. No, it's obvious. It is right and good that something lower on the priority list is getting the most of you, but the best of you doesn't take a lot of time, but it takes intentionality to make sure that person knows, even though this is taking more of me, I'm still with you, heart and soul. And it might look like just pausing in the middle of that day with all the stuff and everything going on with your son, just grabbing your wife's hand, walking down the hallway for a second, closing the door, giving her a hug and just saying, how are you doing? You all right? you need anything? And it might be that the best of you is only 15 seconds or a minute or two, but it's enough to recalibrate the relationship, to breathe in that air and to remember, they're with me. Their their arms are linked with me. I'm not doing this alone. This happened to me just a minute ago, actually, with Sarah. Uh, Today, this morning, Sarah will not give me the most of her. Did you know this? Uh, The most of Sarah this morning is going to go to the church. She loves talking to people and being in conversations. Today, after our last service, she will be the last one that leaves. She'll be talking to the last people that are here. She loves it. She loves it. She loves it. But we're walking by each other just a minute ago, right over there in that hallway, and she reaches out her hand like this. And so I reach my hand out. She just gives me a five and keeps walking. (laughs) Do you know what I thought? Ooh. She likes me. Let's go. I can go. I can go conquer the world. What is that? That's the best of her. I guarantee you that she will not have that same, quite that same moment with you. If you do, I need to know about it. All right. (laughs) See, when I set my priorities, what it means is that I, and so here's, it means that I am factoring in, okay. The best of me means that I'm factoring you in first and always which means that there's never a moment in a busy day where I'm not thinking, uh, I should text Sarah, see if she needs anything on the way home. The best of you is the decision that you make to say that's my highest priority. And this happens with everything on your priority list, by the way. Uh, For me, there was a time where I would put something else on my list of priorities called golf, everybody, because sometimes it's God's will to just go out and lose a thousand golf balls in the woods, right? Just sometimes you got to do it. Uh, There was a time where I coached my boys in every sport growing up because I just wanted to be around them. Why? Because my kids are a priority for me. Yes. 
So I'm coaching my sons at a football practice. And while I'm coaching my sons at a football practice, I'm getting text messages from my friends that they're gonna go play golf. And do you know what I start thinking? How fast can I end this football practice and make it to the golf course with my friends? And in that moment, my little, my little son is running across the football field like a bobblehead with a help football helmet that's you know, way too big for him. And I look him in the eyes and I just think to myself, I am in serious danger of giving my friends my best right now. And so I went home that afternoon, I put the covers on the golf clubs, I stuck them up in the attic and I didn't touch them for a decade. Now, I'm not telling you that so you're impressed with me. I'm telling you that so that you get the gravity of sometimes what it takes to make sure that the things at the top of your list get your best. Now, if my priorities, here's, so here's what I would just want to invite you to do, is to say if my priorities are that important, then have we articulated them? Shared priorities become the groundwork for a covenant relationship in marriage to go, do we agree on this? And, and where do we think these things would fall? And in this season, where are we maybe in danger of not giving each other our best? And so as you evaluate that, what you find out is that if the first priority, okay, is, is kind of summed up in that word leaving, not everything can be equal. I'm going to have to leave some things lower on the priority list. This is what uh, Paul says specifically with your parents. He picks out parents as the thing that has to go down the priority list. Did you catch that? For this cause, a man will leave his father and mother. This happened for Sarah and I with our oldest son. He just got married, precious gal named Hope. And sometimes when you, uh, your son gets married and you say, I gained a daughter. Have you heard that? You know what the truth is? I didn't gain a daughter. Now, it's partly true. I mean, she's like a daughter to us. But, but I did not gain a daughter, and her in-laws did not gain a son. Uh, they are no longer under our parenting the same way they were before. Do you know what God says? You're a whole new family. Which means that if I meddle in their life like I did before, when everything like dad was the wisest voice in their life, well, probably in our case, mom was the wisest voice in their life. And for a long time, that was the gravity of where you went to to make decisions and spend money and how you were going to live your life. Now you have to do that on your own, which means I'm not going to, I'm not going to handle that anymore. You got to go. You got to get out of the nest. You got to go fly. You got to build your own life. Now, if you want to come over and drink a cup of coffee and cry about how your foolish decisions are hurting your life, come on over and then I'm going to kick you out in Jesus name and you got to walk back out into it. Why? You're at a different level, which means Paul says, if the parents are trying to be the priority over the spouse, it's going to break things and cause pain. This is why some of you are in arguments over why do you care about what your mom thinks more than what I think? What's broken? The priority list. Ah, okay. So what do we do? We go back and we evaluate the priority list. We share that agreement together. And the second term that Paul uses is cleaving. So we got to create some priorities, but cleaving is this idea that covenant relationships are based on promises, not feelings. It means that there's a determined commitment in me to hold fast to something no matter what I feel like in the future. This is why as a pastor, uh, I discourage young couples that are getting married from writing their own vows. Now, if, if, if a couple wants to write their own vows, it's cool, I get it, but here's how we normally write vows. Normally when we get married, we're so enamored with the moment that we write vows about how that person makes us feel. And we say things like, you know, your eyes are amazing and I can't imagine life without you and what I was before was nothing and you came in and you, you, know, you filled a hole in my heart and all this kind of stuff. And what we're doing is we're, we're describing how we feel today, but that's not a vow. A vow in a covenant relationship is not based on what you are to me today or how you make me feel today. A vow in a covenant is a description of who I promise to be tomorrow, even when those things of today change. This is why old time Christian leaders thousands of years ago, uh, when the very first Christian marriages started to happen, they created vows for young people to say, we still use them today. You've heard words like uh, that I, I, make a, I make a vow to my wife and I say for better or worse. Yeah. And for richer or, okay. Here's why really smart church leaders wrote those vows. It's because young couples enamored with each other can't see the worst coming. They don't know that poor is around the corner. So we say, yes, okay, in the better today, but if tomorrow is worse, I'm still with you. That is a covenant vow, a commitment to walk with you, not based on what I feel, but based on what I promise to be in your life, no matter what 
changes. And we understand this first in our covenant relationship with God. God describes his character this way. And he says that he remembers his covenant Okay, forever, Psalm 105, 8. That's a long time, everybody. And he says, the word that he commanded, he remembers for a thousand generations. Now, I want you to think about what could change in a thousand generations. How many sinful, broken, hard-hearted, hard-headed people did God have to love through a thousand generations? There were some great people that followed him and a whole bunch of people that didn't. But you know what he said? I'm making a covenant commitment to you, which means I'm going to be faithful even in the seasons when you're not. Wow. We get a beautiful picture of this in the book Hosea, when Hosea marries an unfaithful woman and God says to Hosea, a remarkable verse, he says, go and love her again. Why? That's how I love you. I'm committed to you ruthlessly. I'm going to stick with you. Why? Because I am in a covenant with you. Now, here's what I know. Most covenant, the covenant relationship of marriage, if they break, they don't usually break because one big moment happened. Usually what happens is our covenant commitment to each other starts to fade in a whole bunch of little small moments. And so the call of a covenant relationship is to remember that it's not just if something major happens, it's in all the tiny little moments of my day I have to make the determined commitment to remember I am cleaving to Sarah. I'm holding on, to hold fast, to grab a hold of and not let go. And it is in those small moments every single day that the muscles of a covenant relationship grow strong enough to sustain the biggest challenges of life. It is our moment by moment commitment that sustains the season by season changes. And make no mistake, for all of us, there will be seasons that change as we are married to our spouse for decades. But it is the moment by moment commitment that allows it to be something beautiful. And here's how this works. Your covenant commitment to your spouse will be, make no mistake, tested in the hardest times. But do you know, and you've experienced this, it's tested a thousand times all day long. It's tested in the little moment when you wake up in the morning and you walk in the kitchen and you're thinking to yourself, why are you in my space right now? I'm not a morning person. You're a morning person. Why are you happy right now? I don't want to talk. I, don't, I just need my coffee. And you're, you know, you're making sauerkraut next to where I'm trying to make. Why are you doing this? Every morning you do the same thing. What is it? It's a moment. It's a moment to go, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Is the status of my heart an eye roll and a sigh? Or is the setting of my heart covenant commitment in this moment. You're going you're gonna to have it happen this afternoon. You're going to walk into your kitchen, you're going to open the drawer, and the trash is going to be full. And you're going to know, I just passively, aggressively told you to take out the trash. I know for a fact I walked in here and said, the trash is full, which means take out the trash, and you didn't. Okay, in this moment, the moment by moment, here's what the moment by moment covenant commitment is built on. Two things, write these words down. It's based on honesty and grace. And one of those two tools are what you're going to have to reach for. Sometimes honesty means that I say, hey, um, I, I needed you to take the trash out and I'm frustrated that you didn't take the trash out. What is that? I'm not just going to be mad at you and allow this moment to cre create a crack in our relationship. I'm going to be honest with you. Why? The only way I can be in a covenant with somebody is if they know me. So sometimes the answer in the moment is honesty. Other times it's just grace. Sometimes you go, <laughs> it's it's not that big a deal. I can take out the trash, and when I take out the trash, I'm not knocking it against all the hallway walls, you know, <laughs> making sure you know I'm taking out the trash, singing a song about how I wish I was married to somebody that could take out the trash, right? That's not grace, right? Grace is, I got this. Why? Because I'm ruthlessly committed to you. And here's how, here's how this works for all of us, okay? We all get married, and we look like this. This is you, and um, it's it's, it's beautiful. Like, you're just amazing. And this is your spouse. You go, oh my gosh, this guy. Like, I mean, it's amazing. And when you get married, you're both amazing. I mean, you have like beautiful eyelashes and I don't know, he's got like biceps like the rock. And it's just like, look at us. We're amazing. We're perfect. Life is going to be great. There's nobody that's been married like us before. Sure. My family had issues and yeah, I get that marriages fall apart, but we got this on lock, baby. We're going to have, this is going to be amazing. And we're ready to go conquer the future. But what none of us see, but anybody that's been married for a long time can tell you is that there is an invisible bulldozer 
right? And it's headed straight toward you. And it is not a happy bulldozer, okay? And it's loaded, loaded with things like trauma. And sometimes it's his trauma that you don't know about or her trauma that you thought you were over and something brings it back up and all of a sudden we realize, I thought we were past that and here it is dropped in the middle of our relationship. Sometimes it's a brand new shared trauma that neither of us saw coming and now we gotta deal with this. Dad died or mom went through this or the, jo- the job ended, right? And now all of a sudden we gotta deal with this. Sometimes it's just triggers. And you didn't know when you got married that folding the socks perfectly and color coding them only in the second drawer of the dresser was going to be a massive deal. You had no idea, but when you did it wrong, it exploded. But what you didn't realize was it's not about socks. It's about the fact that that is the gauge of whether or not I've got my life in order. You go, whoa, okay, okay, okay. So I know Sarah does not do that. I don't want anybody thinking that. You didn't realize that that was a thing. And now it hits you and it's like full Miley Cyrus. It's just hits you like a wrecking ball. It's just like, what do I, what do I do with that? And for all of us, Regardless of what this carries, it always, always for all of us carries new seasons. The person you married in year one will not be the person you're married to in year 10. The person you're married to in year 10 will not be the person you're married to in year 30. And it is, okay, for all of us, a process of realizing I have to develop the muscles in the small moments to love you when the big seasons change. Here's what happens when we get married. We think that it's always gonna be this way. Uh, When you're first married, you get up on Saturday morning, you go to your favorite coffee shop, the trendy one on the corner, and you get a perfect cup of pour over coffee, and then you go do hot yoga, and then you ride your bicycle down Riverside together, and everything's great, and then you go do crossword puzzles, and the birds are singing, and everything's perfect, and then you have a baby. What happens? Seasons change. But here's what you think. Well, I mean, yeah, we have a kid, but I'm still going to get up on Saturday morning and go get pour over coffee and do hot yoga and ride my bicycle and do crossword puzzles. And then she gets up first and she's walking out of the house in her stretchy pants and she hands you the baby to go get pour over coffee and do hot yoga and ride her bicycle and do crossword puzzles. You go, hold on. I thought this was going to go totally different than this. What happened? A new season just broke into your life and you're going to discover whether or not you were developing the muscles in the small moments to handle the big moment. And the reason that I want you to value that so much is because the lens, the grace, the truth that you're living with in those little moments in the kitchen, those little moments in the car, those little moments at work, those little moments factoring them in, they are the building blocks of the big moments. And here's the reality, covenant commitment sets the conditions. It doesn't guarantee it, but it sets the conditions for learning to love someone again and again. When Sarah and I first moved to California to pastor a church, um, there was a man who served on the board of this church, and I didn't know it, but he was going to become one of the great mentors in my life. His name was Bryce Jessup. He was in his 80s when I met him, a stately looking man with bright gray hair, uh, had a wonderful presence about him, always had a smile on his face. And uh, when I first met him uh, at, at lunch, it was as though I'd known him for most of my life. And he was one of the first people in my life that was an an older, uh, wiser uh, pastor that just said, hey, I'm going to be your mentor. Like, you're not, like, I'm going to be with you. I've got you. And I'm going to, I'm like, he, it was just like, he put his arms around me and walked with me through this whole journey of leading this church. And he would call me and he would text me. And he's just, have you ever been around somebody? It's just like, you just think this person is Jesus Jr. I mean, it's just like, I I want to be like you. I want to be you. Would you just trade bodies with me? He's just that kind of guy. But of all the things that he did for me that meant so much to me, the thing that spoke loudest into my life was how he loved his wife. He was married for over 50 years to a gal named Shirley Joe, and he just called her Joe. And Joe was this kind of perfect, bigger than life social personality. She was always the life of the party, always the one organizing the social event. She's the person you wanted to talk to first, and she, she was the smile that lit up the room. But that's not how she was when I met her. See. Joe had had a series of three strokes in a row, and when I met her, she was in a wheelchair. Just this precious, really frail, bright gray hair lady in her 80s 
who could no longer speak. And I watched Bryce take her in that wheelchair with him everywhere he went. And the way he did it was so beautiful and so remarkable. I had never seen anything like it before. He would bring her into church and as he's walking down the hall with her, when they encountered somebody, he'd stop. I'd never seen this before. And he started to have a conversation with them for her. It wasn't like he was having a conversation, it was like she was. And he would ask questions for her. Things that after being married 50 years, he just knew she would wanna know. And he would tell them about her day about what this week had been like and how she was feeling and he would share. And if the conversation went on long enough, he would just get down on one knee and he'd have his hand around her and he'd just be having this conversation. Somebody that could no longer form words, he was her voice. For somebody that could no longer walk, he was her legs. And sometimes when they were walking down the hall and he didn't know I was watching, I would just hear him talking to her. Nobody to impress. Nobody to show off how great a husband he was, just talking to her. And one day, I'll never forget, we're walking out of church and he's walking to his car. I'm behind him. He doesn't know I'm there. About as far away as that wall is from me now. And he's walking to his car. I'm walking to mine. And I just hear him singing over her. He would often say that she loved old hymns. And she said, he would often say that her favorite is, it is well with my soul. And I just hear him singing, it is well it is well with my soul and right underneath his voice i hear her humming she can't form words but she's just forming the tune with her voice and as i'm watching this couple in their 80s loving each other like that and as i'm watching him i'm struck by two thoughts at the same time the first is i want to love sarah like that Man, I want to love her like that. I want her to love me like that. Man, I want her to push me in a wheelchair and sing song. Like, I want, I want that. And at the same moment, I'm struck by the fact that that's exactly how God loves me. See, a covenant relationship says this, by its very implication, I will love you when things are difficult. You made a covenant relationship with somebody because you knew in the ancient world, I can't do this on my own, I need a partner. And I hope in that picture you see the covenant love that God has for you, do you see it? That he doesn't just love us when we're at our best. He loves us in every changing season, in every moment of need. And it's because of that love that he can look at us confidently and say, now, I want you to love people just like that. Wow. Would you pray with me? Lord, this morning, we're so thankful for your covenant love for us. And as we consider what place a covenant relationship has in our lives, God, I ask that you would give us grace today. Help us to see the places where we need to strengthen that, to reorganize priorities, to make sure that our spouse is getting the best of us. Lord, would you help us to have clarity, supernatural light bulbs that go off in our brain and in our heart in the little moments. God, would you help us to see how we can love people through those changing seasons, just like you've loved us. And this morning, for just a moment with heads bowed and eyes closed before we rush out of here, maybe you're aware this morning that you don't have a relationship with God like that. And he's been stirring in your heart this morning. And you know, man, I want, a, I want a relationship with God like that. Can I give you the greatest news? He made you to have that kind of relationship and he wants it more than you do. And it doesn't take long. You don't have to earn a place in that relationship. It happens in a moment when you give Jesus your heart. You can begin today a brand new season of following Jesus, confident that because of his grace, your sins are forgiven and you're walking with him into a brand new future. And so we're gonna pray a prayer before we leave this morning. And if I've described you, here's what I want you to do. I want you to jump in and pray this prayer with us. And here's the confidence I have. Jesus will meet you right where you sit as you pray this prayer. So church, would you say this with me? Say, dear heavenly father, thank you for Jesus. I believe he died, but rose again for me. I choose to follow you. I'm all yours in Jesus name. Amen. Church, would you put your hands together with me and celebrate new life? Come on.